this has been a very tumultuous week than I can tell. And it isn't no one event or two events. It's just a culmination of all the days piling in at once. Ladies and gentlemen, I have expended myself for the last couple of months because I was trying to provide as much information to you all as I possibly could. And I may have overdone it. You may have overdone it. Yeah, I may have overdone it. What you overdo? Well, a couple of library books. And... Oh, come on, would you stop that? Well, you asked a dumb question. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we got some things we want to talk about, but like I said, I have a routine now. We're going to tie in something. This ain't got nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about in a minute, the reason for this video. But watch this. Okay, you guys have heard this phrase before, right? Follow your heart. Hold on. My uh, iHeartRadio, Hootie and the Blowfish, when she's gone, y'all gonna have to hold on, okay? Hootie and the Blowfish! Sorry, I, I do Hootie now. I promise you, I did not listen to Hootie when I was growing up. But Darius or Darius, I don't know how he pronounced his name. He has won me over. When he went to country, I heard a couple of his country songs, and he sounded all right. So I listened to Hootie and the Blowfish. I added them to iHeart. I did not listen to them before I got iHeart. And thus, Hootie and the Blowfish in the background. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm certain, and the reason why I am talking about this is because of music. Have you heard the phrase, follow your heart? You guys have heard that phrase, right? Now, we're not talking about veganese. Okay, we're not talking about vegan food. We are talking about the phrase, follow your heart. Okay, this phrase is all over the place. They even tell people, here, listen to your heart. You guys have heard that, right? Let, let's, well, you, you got to go with your heart. Okay, you... You, you got what I need, the late Biggie. I mean, not Biggie. <laughs> oh, Lord, I am so sorry. Biz Marquis, I apologize. Biggie, I apologize. Biz Marquis, ladies and gentlemen, the late Biz Marquis and the late Biggie. Okay, you, G-O-T-T-A-G-O-W-I. I T H Y O, no, Y O is already there. You got to go with your heart. Now, what we're going to do so that we don't get no veganese uh, communication, because this is, this is not Chrome that we're searching. This is cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. Okay, now let's, and you know, it says single version. That's exactly what we want to do. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to go with the music. Because there's a reason why you hear the songs with this title. Do not think that they are just haphazardly naming songs. Got to go with your heart or you got to follow your heart or you got to listen to your heart. Don't think that they are coming up with this and deciding, you know what? That sounds like a good title for a song. So let's do that. That's not the way it works, ladies and gentlemen. It has never worked that way. It has never worked that way. The music industry is controlled. Controlled. That's right, because it's a con game. Translate it again, mother. All right. L ladies and gentlemen, hold on. Let me show y'all something. You know, I should have done YouTube, but I ain't going to. What are you doing? Ain't nobody asked you to do that. Get back over here. It ran from me, y'all. Hold on. Go with your heart, okay? You got to go break my heart. No, we ain't got no, ain't nobody breaking no hearts. It's going with your heart, okay? The reason why I put it in it that way is so that you guys will know 
that this is a common lyric. See? John Young, listen to your heart. Okay, not the not the only one that sings a song. Not I'm giving you my heart. Nobody cares about those type of songs. We're talking about the songs where it's telling people to rely on their own heart. You gotta go with your own feelings. You gotta go with how you feel inside. You you guys have heard those things before, right? Well, let me tell you where they came from. Because I know I know some of you are not gonna believe it. Because you don't understand who the Illuminati and the Freemasons are. They control the music industry, ladies and gentlemen. They control the music industry so much they keep pumping this stuff into people's heads. You keep repeating something over and 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 over again, and eventually everybody will believe it. Terrorist bombings. 9-11, terrorist attack, 9-11, terrorist attack, 9-11, Al-Qaeda, 9-11, terrorist attack, 9-11, 9-11, oh no, that was the worst day, in the, oh, they, the, what they did was so terrible. For weeks, they continued to say the same thing, 24 hours a day on every news channel, repeating the same words. It's called conditioning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's show you where conditioning comes from. This is taken from the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremiah, wanted, he wasn't a bullfrog. Uh-uh, not a met Jeremiah. Jeremiah was nobody's bullfrog. 17th chapter, verse number nine. Pay attention, y'all. The heart is more treacherous. That's right. Your heart is deceitful. The heart is more treacherous than anything else and is deceptive. Who can know it? Ah. Uh, I, Jehovah, am searching the heart. See, Jehovah examines hearts. Says he examines all the way to the kidney. The kidneys is the innermost organ in the human body. So he examines the innermost thoughts of man to give each one according to his ways. He can read hearts. But ladies and gentlemen, man cannot read hearts. So let me show you something what man does. Man is the one telling you to listen to your heart. And you're going to listen to man, ain't you? Ain't you? So let's go back a second. This is the 10th chapter, and we're going to go to verse 23. Let me show you something about what man does. 10th chapter of Jeremiah. You notice how Jeremiah kept on these subjects? You look at verse 23. Jer Uh-oh. I done messed up again, y'all. You see what I did? I keep doing stuff like that. What I was trying to do is slide on over, but it won't let me slide over. I'm trying to make more room. But it won't let me do that, so I got to make room, room that way, okay? We can go back down to 23. Jeremiah says, I well know, O Jehovah, that man's way does not belong to him. It does not belong to man who is walking even to direct his step. Ladies and gentlemen, how many times have you made a misstep? We call them mistakes, but they are missteps. How many times have you made a mistake? How many? I've made many of them, and I'm not afraid to admit that, because I am man. Hear me roar! Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, because I am imperfect, I am man, and I've made many missteps, which is why I rely on this person right here to guide my steps. Why? Because I am not capable of guiding my own steps. I know that. You see, that's where knowledge comes from. That's where growth comes from. That's where wisdom comes from. Recognizing your limitations. Don't take my word for it. Go and do your research on that. You'll become the wisest person in your group once you recognize what your limits are. Well, what if everybody else recognizes what their limits are? Then that means that everybody's wise? You better believe it. The reason why I'm showing this to you guys is because I keep doing videos telling people, hey, this is what you need to do. And the first thing people will say, well, I already done tried that. And ladies and gentlemen, let me help you out. Ain't nobody asked anybody what they already done tried. You did not hear me say in any video, what have you tried already? Have you tried this? Well, why not try this? We are not seeing what sticks to the wall. Okay, it just like that. 
Now, this is what I wanted. Oh, hey, you guys, I want to tell you something. Do y'all know the Pirate Bay is back? PirateBay.org. The PirateBay.org is back. Did y'all know that? Must have won that case. I didn't even know. Woo, doggy. Anyway, if you don't know what it is, do your research on it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I put in Google the other day. GAAP accounting for transferable state tax. Now, I didn't actually put in for state tax. I just put GAAP accounting for transferable tax credit. Ladies and gentlemen, do your research on how to do tax credit transferences. Okay? Because you have to transfer it from you to the corporation or from the corporation to you. Do your research, people. I, look. Ladies and gentlemen, all the other guys out there who've got companies and who are trying to help people with mortgages and everything, they're keeping all this stuff to themselves. Go ahead. Notice that there are no secrets. Well, how come you didn't give us that document about your preemptory challenge to the court? Oh, because that's not a secret. That's proprietary information. I'm not allowed to give that to you. That information is reserved for a special group of people. Eventually, it will get out there. But for right now, it ain't there. And they have an NDA. Well, why'd you do the NDA? You know, it eventually, because I know and nothing hidden will be uncovered. So there's no reason for hiding anything. It's just those individuals have first dibs. Why? Because they are paying for a service. You are not. Well, I'll pay you for it. Just tell me how much. Oh, no, I can't be bought. I ain't trying to buy you. I'm trying to buy the document. Okay, well, go right ahead and buy it. Well, who can I get it from? I don't know. You go right ahead and buy it from whoever you want to buy it from. Let them worry about getting sued. Now go on now. Get on out my face. No, get the out my face. I ain't got time for you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have something we need to talk about. So we're going to minimize this so that we can talk. Then we're going to watch the blocks. Because I was sitting on the block of the bay. Watching the blocks roll away. I'm just sitting on the block of the bay. Anyway, those of you who have mortgages, you have these banks who claim that they loaned you money. We've already shown you that they didn't loan you money. They loaned you credits. Ladies and gentlemen, apparently... You guys have not read the law. What law are you talking about? Well, many people refer to it as HJR 192. Stop referring to it as HJR 192. It is not HJR 192. Hold on. Let me show you what law it is. Now, I'm going to give you the actual title of it, but we're going to put in a different title. Uh-oh. The, and I'm going to spell this wrong. Why? Because I'm tired. They are. All right. The Gold Abrogation Act, ladies and gentlemen. That is the official title for what people refer to as HGR 192. HGR 192 was repealed, because you can repeal a resolution, but you can't repeal a congressional act. There is two, I didn't say arbitration. Oh, God. See, I said arbitration. Oh, <laughs> that's an S. I wasn't, uh, let's see if it got it. The Gold Act of 1933? No, I don't think it's the Gold Act. Give me my give me my word. Spell my word correctly. Oh, let's say any. Yeah. Hold on. He's just going to let it look for it. I don't think it's the Gold Act, but it's the Gold Arbitration Act, and we'll let it correct it. Uh, gold Arbitration, stupid morons. Hold on. Give me a second. I'll find it, and I'll be right back. It's okay. I was going to get it right eventually. And what I mean by eventually, let me, uh, uh oh, I just messed up. I'm on my, uh, I'm on my 
cell phone. So I just messed up. So I've been trying to do that right there. Do you see this? Now, this person wrote this on June 5th, 2017. So we're going to go here. This is a dot com, and I usually tell you guys to stay away from dot com, but they're going to explain it to you. And the problem is, there is nothing here on this page that talks about. I put the R in the wrong place. That was the issue. Obligation means to get rid of. So they got rid of the gold clause in the Constitution. Did Congress have the authority to do that? Well, Congress had the authority to regulate commerce. The gold clause wasn't commerce. It says that Congress could not make anything other than such and such, such and such legal tender. So the Supreme Court reasoned, and so did Congress. We got the right to do what we want. And what you gonna do about it is what they said. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to say, you know, we're glad you got rid of the gold. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are going to stop saying HGR 192 in court. HGR 192, just like the case where we told you the person was using 12 USC 95B, which doesn't exist anymore. It's been transferred to a different section of the code. And so the court ignored everything else he was saying because he used an invalid code. So stop using a stupid code. Okay? Stop using a stupid code. I'm waiting to explain this to you guys, ladies and gentlemen, so that you get it. On June 5th and 6th of 1933, the United States went off the gold standard a monetary system in which the currency was backed by gold. When Congress enacted the, uh, uh, they did enact the joint resolution. They did enact the joint resolution, nullifying the right of creditors to demand payment in gold. The United States had been on the gold standard since the 1870s, except for an embargo of gold. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States been on the gold standard since before then. It's just that they traded in many different standards because of the Bill of Exchange Act. The president, President Roosevelt, issued an executive order. This was all a plan, ladies and gentlemen. And to back up the president's executive order, to back up the executive order, Congress enacted an act. The executive order has not been repealed, people. So do yourself a favor, go and pull the executive order. What's the number of the executive order? Oh God, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. This is what happens when you go to sites like this. They do stupid things like this. Okay, can't stand that stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll show you the executive order in a second, okay? I'm going to read just a little bit more. On June 5th, 1933, the United States went off the gold standard. The monetary system of currency was backed by gold. Now, the United States had been on the gold standard since 1879, except for the embargo of gold exports during World War I. But bank failures during the Great Depression of the 1930s frightened the public into hoarding gold. No, it didn't. That was a presumption. The banks had already had the letter written up talking about there was going to be a hoarding of gold. Nobody hoarded anything. Ladies and gentlemen, we need you all to understand what's going on here. The rest of this article ain't got nothing to do with what we need to talk about. So we're going to, I just wanted to point out certain things to you. It's called the Gold Abrogation Act. And then now you want to mention the executive order because that's currency in the United States, okay? So let's talk about this so that you guys get it. I gotta make sure I don't click on anything because then we'll be here all day. 
we we don't want those comments see those comments take us off subject so let me put us back on subject because there it is right there executive order 6102 wikipedia is going to tell you wait a minute I was looking at the spelling, nothing wrong with the spelling, they just didn't like the capitalizations. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know this, so I'm hoping you're paying attention. Hey, uh, Earth, yo, when? Hey, could you guys cut down the fire just a little bit? They were scared. Ladies and gentlemen, because something happened along the way, y'all didn't know? Oh, what's, what used to be happy is now sad, okay? Pay attention, everyone. Executive Order 6102 is an executive order signed on April 5th, 1933 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt forbidding the hoarding of gold, gold bullion, and gold certificates. What the, about gold certificates? Why did he forbid the hoarding of gold certificates? Within the continental United States. So outside the United States, he had no authority because he had to cross international waters. He had no authority. Even if it was a territory, he had no authority. It's the president, not Congress. The executive order was made under the authority of the Trading with the Enemies Act of 1917. That's what the president said in 1933, in March 9, 1933, as amended by the Emergency Economic Banking Relief Act of March 9, 1933. The limitation of gold ownership in the United States was repealed after President Gerald Ford signed a bill legalizing private ownership of gold coins, bars, ladies and gentlemen, hold on. No, it wasn't repealed. He signed a bill, but he never vacated or voided the executive order. Pay attention. This did not get rid of the previous act. You don't repeal an act by creating another act. You guys need to understand that. You don't repeal an act by creating another act. This is, this is the rules of statutory interpretation. If you have two conflicting statutory interpret, I mean two conflicting statutes, the statute that preceded takes precedent because it came first. First in line, first in right. Okay? First in line, first in right. You don't get rid of nothing by creating something new. Okay, for instance, case in point. Man has ruined the earth. We all know that. We all see that. Every single day of our lives, we see that man has ruined the earth. So what do we do? Well, you don't do like they did in most cities. Bury the city and build on top of it because the remnants are still there. Eventually, that will come to haunt you. No, you have to get rid of the old. That's why Jehovah said he made a clean sweep during the flood. Got rid of everything! Why? Because he was making something new. And that's why? Book of Revelation makes it clear that he's making something new, a new heavens and a new earth. Not a literal new heavens, a figurative new heavens and a figurative new earth, because there's nothing wrong with the earth. It is man upon the earth that's a problem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there was a lot wrong with the fact that Congress thought that they could repeal the gold clause, but they couldn't. So, however, Public Law 93-373 did not repeal the Gold Repeal Joint Resolution, which banned any contract that specified payments and a fixed amount of money in gold or a fixed amount of money in gold. That is, contracts remain unenforceable if they use gold monetarily rather than the commodity of trade. However, an act enacted on October 28th, 1977, this law right here, this uh, act, sorry, codified USC, blah, 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 recodified 
as amended, 31 U.S.C. 5118, amending, excuse me, amended the House Joint Resolution to make it clear that parties could again include so-called go-go clauses in their contracts made after 1977. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. This amended the Gold Abrogation Act. It did not repeal the Gold Abrogation Act. Say what? It amended the Gold Abrogation Act. So let's go back to the presidential order. Okay. I don't care about hoaxes. We can care less. I want the House Joint Re- I mean, not the House Joint Resolution. I want the executive order for the president. That's where we're going. Normally, I would go to the actual amendment because I'm going to tell you guys to go to the amendment because I promise you, your remedy is in the amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to pay attention to what I just said. I promise you. Your remedy is in the amendment. I guarantee you. Do you know how I can guarantee you that your remedy is in the amendment that Congress enacted? You'll see in a minute. I'm looking for this um, executive order. See, 2039, we know about 2038, 2036, 2039. We know about those, but I'm looking for this presidential executive order and so i'm looking for the the original one see i don't think this is going to give it to us i think this is just going to talk about executive orders and what an executive order is so i i could care less about that this is the one i'm looking for so come on now i don't want this i just said i didn't want this didn't you just hear me see google playing games y'all google playing games Ain't got time for games. I got to, you guys see I have this back again uh, because this is how many attempts are being made. And so I can stop it from happening, but I like it. I like seeing it because it let me know I'm protected, pro protected, because you got to be proactive, okay? Now, I want to do this executive order because I want to see this in text form. So we're going to do this. We're going to take it. We're going to put it here. And then we're going to put T-E-X-T. And then we're going to put enter. Okay. Let's, hey, look at that. It's uh, education. University of Santa Barbara, California, Santa Barbara. Really? I think that's Santa Barbara. I don't know. Don't know. Let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I want you to do. I need you to pull this executive order plus the amendment to Title 31, Section 5118, 5118. That amendment that was done. I know I'm beating around the bush because you guys, you can't just get to the end of the runway. You have to start someplace. You can't start at the end. You got to start at the beginning. Requiring gold, gold bullion, gold certificates to be delivered to the government. To be delivered to who? To be delivered to the government. By virtue of the authority vested in me, Section 5B of the Act of October 6, 1917, the very same act that they amended on March 9th, ladies and gentlemen, as amended by Section 2 of the Act of March 9th, 1933, entitled an act to provide for the relief of the existing national emergency, two very big words, in banking and for other purposes, in which a mandatory act Congress declared that a uh, Serious emergency existed. Two-thirds government, ladies and gentlemen. Congress and the president joining together. I, Franklin D. Roosevelt, president of the United States of America, do declare that said national emergency still continues to exist and pursuant to said section, 
do hereby prohibit the hoarding of gold, gold bullion, gold certificates within the continental United States by individuals, partnerships, associations, corporations, and hereby prescribe the following regulations for carrying out the purpose of this order. For the purpose of this regulation, the term hoarding shall mean blah, blah, blah. All persons are hereby required to deliver. Number A, such amounts of gold. Number B, gold coin. Number C, gold coin and bullion. Number D, gold coin and bullion. Number three, until otherwise ordered, any person becoming the owner of any gold coin, bullion, or certificates after April 28, 1933. If you had it before 1933, April 28, you'd be okay. Shall within three days after receipt thereof deliver the same in the same manner prescribed in section two, unless such gold coin, gold bullion, gold certificates are held for any of the purposes specified in paragraph A, B, and C of section two or unless such gold or gold bullion is held for the purposes specified in Section D of Section 2. Okay, number Section 4. Upon receipt of the gold, Section 5, membered banks shall deliver, Section 6, the Secretary of the Treasury, out of the sum made available by the President in Section 501 of the Act of March 9, 1933. Continue. Section 7. In cases where the delivery of the gold to gold bullion certificate, number eight, the Secretary of the Treasury is authorized and empowered. Number nine, who willfully violates the provision of this executive order or these regulations or any rule, regulations, or license issued thereunder may be fined not more than 10,000. And if a natural person, natural person, natural person may be imprisoned for not more than 10 years or both or any officer, director, agent of any corporation who knowingly participates in any such violation shall be punished by a fine, imprisonment, or both. This order and these regulations may be modified or revoked at any time. When did they revoke it? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Gold Arbogation Act. This is what led to the June 5th and 6th Act you guys call HGR 192. So you want to add the executive order 6102. You want to add the executive order 6102 to your arguments. Stop saying HDR 192. HDR 192 is not the law. So now that you have HDR 192 out of your brains and you're using the Gold Obligation Act and executive order 6102, there is something else you must do. What's that, homie? Watch and see. Now, this works for mortgages and getting rid of debts and all of that. You all have not been using the law correctly. You have not been using the acts of Congress correctly. You have been using codes. Stop using the code. The code is not the law. The code is only prima facie evidence of quote unquote so called presumptive evidence of some something they want to call law, but it is not the law. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go down to the section I was looking at earlier because we're going to look up that section. I could have just typed it in, but I want to show you guys where I'm going. See, we're talking about the gold obligation. Okay, I didn't come up with that word. That's what it's actually called the Gold Obligation Act. You used to be able to find it under that because that's what Congress entitled the act. But you can't find it no more. Not no more. Oh, boy. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. See, they talk about 1934. The Gold Arbogation Act was the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933. Had nothing to do with 1934. 1934 wasn't even around in 1933. You know what I'm saying, homie? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go here. Now, we should look up the whole thing, but we don't have to. Because this only amended the Gold Arbogation Act. It did not change the Gold Arbogation Act. I don't know why they didn't put a link for this. They put a link for everything else. Man. I had a link the other day. Man, that junk was so hot. 
No, I could have to drink some water. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, I mean the hot thing. That's what I said. It was so hot. Okay. Yeah. No, I ain't playing on nobody's words. That's what you do. Gold claws and consent to sue. Gold claws and consent to sue. Do not, ladies and gentlemen, get distracted because I promise you. Even right here is all you need to understand what's going on. What's going on? What? Oh, I'm not that type of what's going on? Oh, my bad. Ladies and gentlemen, stop using HR 192. I wouldn't even be so bold as to use Section 5118. I would use the phrase, Positive Law Title 31. That's what I would use. I would not use Section 5118. I would use that as subsequent information. Okay? Pay attention, people, so that you understand what's going on. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Public debt obligation means a domestic obligation issued or guaranteed by the United States government to repay money or interest, such as your mortgages, ladies and gentlemen. All homes are owned by the state, and any so-called ownership is only by so-called usury. The United States government may not pay out any gold. A person lawfully holding, don't want that, the government withdraws its consent given to anyone to assert against the government agencies or officers a claim on the gold clause of a debt obligation. A claim for United States coins or currency. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. The United States withdraws its consent given to anyone to assert against the government a claim for United States coins or currency. You don't have the right. They took that away from you. A claim arising out of the surrender, requisition, seizure, or acquisition of United States coin, coinsy, gold, silver. That's why they can take your money, people. Let's continue. Paragraph one of this subsection does not apply to proceedings in which no claim is made for payment or credit in an amount greater than the face nominal value of dollars for the public obligation. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. Or credit. I didn't write this. Except with consent, uh, when consent is not withdrawn under this subsection, an amount appropriate for payment of public debt obligations for the United States coins and currency may be expended only dollar for dollar. Hold on, we ain't finished yet. In this section, obligation means an obligation except United States currency payable in United States money. No such thing as United States money, ladies and gentlemen. United States doesn't have any money. United States only has credit. But it's dollar for dollar. Just keep paying attention. An obligation issued containing the gold clause or governed by the gold clause is disregarded on payment dollar for dollar in the united states coin or currency that is legal tender at the time of payment this paragraph does not apply to an obligation issued after october 27 1977 ladies and gentlemen the part of the gold obligation act which many of you were referring to hr 192 that is your best friend, is the part where it says shall be discharged upon payment, dollar for dollar. The banks are giving you credit. So you have the right to pay them back dollar for dollar in the amount for which they issued the credit. There is no law requiring you to pay more than the value of the property. The value of what's agreed. They decided to give you credit. You did not agree to receive credit. Go back and look. 
Go back and look at your paperwork. You did not agree to receive credit, but they gave you a Truth and Lending Act statement saying they were issuing credit. So take that Truth and Lending Act statement to court. Say, oh no, I'm not here to play games with y'all. Right here it says they gave me credit and I returned the credits to them. So I don't owe them a dime. And unless they can prove conclusively that I agreed to pay them several thousand times over what they gave me and that I was the owner of this property before the agreement was made and that this was the under mutual understanding of the parties. Ladies and gentlemen, do you not know that a contract cannot be entered into by the parties unless they all have the same knowledge? Well, you wrote the contract. You wrote the contract. So it was your understanding, not theirs. You wrote the contract. It's your understanding, not the bank's. So do yourself a favor, ladies and gentlemen. The next time somebody tells you that they're not going to accept your payment, that they only want certified check or money order, you tell them, where did you agree to do that? Go ahead. Show me where I agreed to do that. Show me where that's part of the agreement. And while you at it, do me a favor. Show me where I gave you permission to change the loan number for this contract and create a new contract. Ladies and gentlemen, take a look at your deed of trust. Take a look at your promissory note. It has a number on there. Where on there does it give them permission to create a new number, a new account? You never gave them that permission. Start challenging the foundation. Quit bringing up these obscure arguments. Challenge the foundation. You never gave them permission to change the contract number. That means that's a new contract. You have a right to see the entire accounting plus their taxes since they're required to file taxes. Because you believe that they sent this to the treasury and the treasury credited their account, that they received the exact same credits that they issued to you, plus they received more. And I have a right to bring that before the court. By the way, can't do a foreclosure on this property. Can't have a trustee. There's no mortgage. What are you talking about? There is no mortgage. This was a personal loan. This was not a mortgage. This was not a home loan. A home loan means that they actually provided the home. That they gave me the money for a home. They did not give me the money for a home. They didn't own the home. They gave me a personal loan. Go back and look at all the facts. I took the money, went through escrow, and paid a private owner. This was a private transaction. A private transaction. This was not a three-party transaction. The private owner had nothing to do with this bank, had nothing to do with this agreement. Go back. Where's their signature on this agreement? Where's their consent to this agreement? This was not an agreement with the private owner. This was a private loan. In order for this to be a home loan, that means that private owner would have to be part of this agreement. It would have to be a three-way agreement. There is no three-way agreement. The only thing the private owner agreed and consented to do was to sell me the home. They sold me the home, didn't sell it to the bank. And then the bank sitting up here doing something called a closing, forcing me to sign these documents, not giving me my keys until I sign them. That's called extortion, people. You can bring it up now because that's fraud. That's attempt to defraud. They are attempting to claim that the loan is something other than it's not. Does it matter how they worded the law, ladies and gentlemen? It's the foundation. The foundation, if this is a home loan, then that means that they would have given me the money for the home initially. That would have been the agreement at the beginning. That the home would have been the consideration from the beginning. When I applied for the loan, the home was nowhere in sight, not even considered by the parties because it wasn't a home loan. 
when you applied, they approved you based upon your credit worthiness. That's simple. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope this information proves to be beneficial to some of you. It's always been there. It has not been hiding from you. Stop using the codes, ladies and gentlemen. Start using the statutes at large because that's the statutes that the courts are bound by. They are not bound by the code, which is why it's not working for you. Look, we're going to do it one more time, then I'm going to get on out of here. So that you guys get it, P-O-S-I-T-I-V-E. Law. Ladies and gentlemen, a positive law title of the code is a title that has been enacted as a statute. A title, not a code. A title. The positive law title of the code. Just the title. Title 18, that's the positive law. The rest of that junk ain't law, people. To enact a title. A positive law codification bill is introduced in Congress. The bill repeals existing law on a certain subject and restates those laws in a new form, a positive law title of the code. Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I knew this, but I didn't know this. We got to go here. Oh, Lord. You guys, you guys need to understand something. None of these codes are legal. None of these codes, not even the statute at large, is legal. I want you guys to. Oh, Lord have mercy. We gotta make this bigger. Where is my. Where, where are you at? Oh, God. Let's go over here. Give me a second. I'll be right back. All right. I need y'all to see this. The term positive law, when used with respect to the United States Code, as in positive law codification or positive law title of the code, the term positive law, the term positive law, has a special and particular meaning. In general, no, specific, especially in legal philosophy, philosophy, the term positive law is used more broadly. There is an over, overstep, overlap, to be sure. But the meaning of the term as used generally is not identical to the meaning of the term as used with respect to the code. So look, generally, they can say whatever they want is what they're saying. However, specifically, the way they're using it generally has nothing to do with the code. And the distinction must be understood to avoid confusion. What's the distinction? Exactly what I just said. doesn't matter how a judge sits up there and wants to explain to you about a positive law. You need to go in there and say, this ain't positive law. Y'all can't bring that junk against me. And you bring this section right here from the U.S. House. In general, the term, now remember, they already done told you to stay away from general. They just told you there is an overlap for sure, but the meaning of the term as generally used is not identical to the meaning of the term with respect to the code. The meaning of the generally used term has nothing to do with law. It's what they just said. So stay away from the general. General is the weakest insurance company out there. Don't care if they do have Shaq as their mascot. That's right, you heard me say mascot, i.e. law. So, in general, the term positive law connotes statutes. It, it basically, it's referring to the statutes at large, i.e. law, that has been enacted by a duly authorized legislature. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, no, that's not what this means. This is not law, this is just some writing on a website. Let's, let's find out what it really means. 
within the context of the code. Now that's we. Oh God, I'm so glad we got there because before we were speaking generally with stuff that don't mean nothing. Okay, hold on. In general, however, especially in legal philosophy. So we're dealing with philosophy here. The Bible says stay away from these man philosophy, philosophy of men. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where are we at? Where where my philosophy? Philosophy. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all think I'm kidding. I told you, I go by scripture. So let's do... I'm putting in philosophy of men. Oh no, I can barely see that part of the screen. Where I put this at? No way in the world, I'm going to try to type right now. Oh no, I'm tired. So that's why I can barely see it. Because I'm exhausted. Paul says, look out. Perhaps that there may be some who will carry you off as his prey through the philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary things of the world and not according to the Christ. Because it is in him that all the fullness of the divine quality dwells bodily. Ladies and gentlemen, he says, be careful. Look out! Hold on! Perhaps there might be someone who will carry you off as his prey. How many of you have been carried off as praise by the court because they've been using the stupid code trying to tell you that that junk is law? Preach it, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, the code is not law. Stop using the stupid code. Pay attention. Within the context of the code, the term positive law is used in a more limited sense. Well, how limited is it? A positive law title of the code is a title that has been enacted as a statute. Just the title. To enact the title, that's how limited it is. A positive law codification bill is introduced into Congress. Hold on now. The bill repeals existing laws. Wait, hold on. The bill repeals existing laws. You mean it repeals the actual statute at large? The bill repeals existing laws? But hold on. The bill, the bill is not law. It's just a bill to enact a stupid title. But not the actual law. Ladies and gentlemen, go back and look. It's called Title 18. Wait, hold on. I want y'all to see because I did not I did not get this until just now. When I was doing this video, I'd seen it before. But watch this. Positive. Law. T-I-T-L-E-S. Positive Law Titles. Watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not positive law, see, positive law codification. A positive law title is basically one law enacted by Congress in the form of a title of the code. Not the code, ladies and gentlemen, the title of the code, but not the code. Lord have mercy, and I know I wish somebody proved me wrong. About half of the titles of the code have been revised, codified, and enacted into positive law. Just the titles, ladies and gentlemen, but not the code itself. There are too many mistakes in the titles and the codes. Okay? There are too many mistakes in the codes. See, the United States Code titles have positive and non-positive law titles. The United States Code titles, not the United States Code, but the titles, people. 
that stupid cold junk that they be coming at y'all with is not the law. E-R-R-O-R-S. I want errors. You, you know I'm looking for errors. Um... No, don't care about that stupid stuff. Uh, an error that does, in fact, let's see, based on artifacts that the codification process, an error that does, in fact, blah, blah, blah. I do know that there are several, I've done several videos telling you guys about the errors. Okay, 1878 edition of the revised statute corrected errors, but they didn't correct all of them, ladies and gentlemen. There are too many errors in the code, and they know that, and they have been slow. Correct technical errors. Yeah, whatever. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there are too many errors in the code, and they are too lazy to correct it. Why? Because then you would find out that that junk ain't law. Because some idiot is doing some video on YouTube telling all that junk ain't law. But now you have Congress telling you to enact the title. A positive law codification bill was introduced in Congress to enact the title. Just the title. The bill repeals existing law. Like the statute of large. It says existing laws like the statute of large. On a certain subject and restates those laws in a new form just by a title without any wording, ladies and gentlemen. So, start hammering them on the fact that you can't charge me with that. That ain't the law. You have the right to do that now. The titles of the code have not been enacted through this process are called non-positive law titles. Just the titles. Non-positive law titles of the code are compilations of statutes. The Office of Law Revision Council is charged with making editorial decisions regarding the selection and arrangement of provisions of statute that are into the non-positive law titles of the code. Non-positive law titles, as such, have not been enacted by Congress, but the laws assembled in the non-positive law titles have been enacted by Congress. Hold on. But the laws assembled in the non-positive law titles have been enacted by Congress. So hold on. The non-positive law titles, as such, have not been enacted by Congress. Pay attention. But the laws assembled in the non-positive law titles have been enacted by Congress. See, what they're saying is that the stuff that's being referred to in the title has been enacted by Congress in the non-positive law title. But all of the positive law titles, remember, Congress, by enacting it to a positive law title, gets rid of all of those laws that have been enacted by Congress. The ones that have been assembled. So they make them null and, invo uh, null and void because they were the existing laws on certain subjects. Okay? So they repeal those existing laws. In both positive law titles and non-positive law titles of the code, all of the law set forth is positive law in a general sense. Of the term. See? Do you notice how they put that caveat there? General? Y'all need to stay away from the general. Okay, that fool will get y'all in trouble. We ain't dealing with general. We dealing with the limited context. Within the context of the code, within that limited context, how do we know? It's used in a more limited sense. So we're going to stick with limitations because that's what Congress had was limitations. That's why they've never enacted that junk. Because they don't have the authority. The 
this is from the House of Representatives website for the United States government. Why is there a specialized meaning of the term positive law with respect to the United States Code? And why is this term used despite the potential for confusion with the broader meaning given the identical term in legal philosophy? Well, the answer involves a historical solution. No, it doesn't. The answer involves the simple fact that they know that, that doesn't, that's not law. And it doesn't apply, and that Congress had no authority. That's why they only enact the title. They don't enact the law. That junk is not law. That's just a title. Like a book has a title. Just because you give a title to a book doesn't make it a law. Positive law, typically, there's that generally coming again. Positive law typically consists of enacted laws. No, because once it's enacted in the positive law, it repeals all the laws associated with it. Positive law typically, typically, typically consists of enacted laws, codes, statutes, and regulations that are applied or enforced in the courts. No, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We just learned that positive law is only the title. There is no such thing as positive law. Pay attention. I want you to pay attention because I didn't say it. Within the context of the code, the term positive law is used in a limited sense. A positive law title of the code is a title that has been enacted as a statute. It's just a title, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we could say that. That's why we could say that the courts are not enforcing the law. They're enforcing a presumption, and you're not rebutting a presumption. Shame on you! The term derives from the medieval use of positum, meaning to establish or position. So that the phrase positive law literally means law established by human authority. Ladies and gentlemen, the phrase positive law means man-made. Hold on, let me see if I can prove it to you. Look out! Perhaps there may be someone who will carry you off as his prey through philosophy, empty deception, deception according to the traditions of men. Did they not just tell you that this is according to tradition? Derived from medical use, tradition. He says, look out! People, Y'all need to look out. Now, if y'all don't realize, this is Colossians, the second chapter, verse 8. If y'all don't realize how much these idiots go according to scripture, then what am I talking to you guys for? I just told you at the beginning of this video exactly who you all are. I'm sitting up here doing this for you, trying to educate you. Everybody wants to say, hey, well, I've been waiting for a long time for you to say this and say that, and you still ain't saying it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been saying this the whole time. Now, I will give a young man named Dwayne McCoy, I'll give him his credit. He's the one who was emphasizing positive law, but he wasn't emphasizing it this way. He wasn't talking about the title. Prior to that, I had only heard of positive law and never paid attention to it, but he was focused on the positive law aspect of things. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that you, if you have any court cases, you focus on positive law. You focus on positive law. Even in your state, it is the exact same thing. That junk on a state level is not the law. The law in a state is the Constitution. Look at your Constitution. It does not give the legislature authority to do jack. No, they keep amending it. The only amendments to a state constitution is that for which the people voted on. You don't believe me? Go back and read your constitution. It doesn't give the state legislature the authority to do whatever they want. Right now in California, the people have said, hey, y'all need to reduce the prison population. They came up with a proposition called Proposition 57. Do you know the prisons are ignoring it? And the courts are letting them? You would be surprised. There was a man. His name was Fred. Fred actually was all right. Uh, he was, I think 
was 94 when I met him. And Fred had been in jail. He was a lifer. Fred died, ladies and gentlemen. People say good riddance. Nah, not good riddance. I don't know what the man did. I don't know if he was guilty or not guilty. What I do know and what I can tell you is he did not deserve to die the way he did. Fred was getting older, so he was finding himself falling a lot. And he was injuring himself even when I was there. But they wouldn't do anything for him. Eventually, they gave him a walker. Two months ago, Fred fell and hit his head. He had an obvious concussion. You know what they did? They looked at him and sent him back. Go ahead and go to sleep. You ain't got to worry about it. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred is dead. And I'm not making it as a joke. I'm making it as a, I'm very serious. Fred died two days after he fell. He received no medical treatment. Couldn't even get the information to his family because I didn't have enough information to get to his family. But I would have told them because I found out exactly what happened with Fred. There is no more social distancing in the prisons, ladies and gentlemen. They are back to doing things the way they were doing. Now, I know many of you don't care about the people who are inside these jails. But from a person who has put himself there... Trying to help the people in there and trying to help you guys who are going to places like that. Trying to make things better. Trying to prove to you what you can and cannot say when walking into those things. Testing out the system. Who also put their life on the line like this? Yeah, I know Mr. Diamond did. But look at that. They shot him up in front of the Superior Court building in California, Los Angeles. That's right. His name was Diamond. I haven't been able to find the case that he was involved in. But I do know of the situation. Putting himself in jail, trying to help people. And while he was on his way to court one day, I, I don't know what happened. I know it was probably after he had gotten out and he was going after him and suing him. Next thing you know, drive-by shooting. Downtown Los Angeles, not South Central Los Angeles. Downtown Los Angeles at the Superior Court building. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no drive-bys in downtown Los Angeles. Well, there weren't back then. That's called a hit. See, the people who go into that environment to try to help people put their lives on the line. And I will tell you the last two times, that's exactly what I faced. Officers, COs trying to set me up. Literally trying to set me up. To the point where, on two occasions, I had the so-called shot callers coming to me saying, look, man, let me tell you what, what's going on. Literally, pulling me to the side, let me tell you what's going on. This is what they're asking us to do, and I am deciding, no, we're not going to do that. Thank you, Jehovah. It wasn't his decision, that was Jehovah's decision. I'm going to tell it to you like it is, because that's the God I serve. I told you, he's the one who let me know I was going to be in that environment in the first place. So if he's going to warn me in advance, like I begged him and asked him for then he's going to be the one that I'm going to rely on. But on both occasions, the individuals came to me, look, hey, I'm going to be straight with you. This is what they're asking us to do. Okay? I even had a female officer in Spanish in Puerto Rico to all the inmates I raped an eight-year-old boy. No evidence, no proof whatsoever, no charge, but that's what she told them have no idea, ladies and gentlemen, the stupidity of these idiots. Now, we're not even going to stop there. We're not going to stop there. We're going to talk about the ones who were going around saying that I'm supposed to have been someone's snitch. You guys see how I don't get nobody else's business. I don't care about anybody else's business. What am I going to be snitching on? I don't hang around idiots. I'm not a, if I see something, I'm going to say something. Now, if it's my business, you better believe I'm open my mouth. But I'm not afraid to sit up there and tell people because they've heard me say it. You all have heard me say it. I don't hold my tongue. Did you say that? Yeah, mother, I said that. And I'll say it again. You know, that's me. 
if you don't believe it, just go back and listen to the videos and see how much joking I'm not doing when I talk like this. You don't hear me joking right now. But only because of how I am did the individuals in there understand that everything that they were accusing, the officers were accusing, trying to cause somebody to get hurt, trying to cause... Ladies and gentlemen, you don't understand how many people get shanked in jail. You guys don't understand how many people actually die because of these stupid rumors. The officers know exactly what they're doing. The ones who pay the... Do you know that they will pay the inmate with extra time outside their cell for them to kill someone? And the inmates are intelligent enough to do something like that? Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, stop being empty-minded saps. Stop being led alone. We talked at the very beginning. We started off with the heart is more treacherous than anything else. Stop listening to your own stupid hearts. It's your heart that leads you, gets you in trouble. Why? Because your heart is your conscience. When the Bible is talking about the heart, it's not talking about the literal heart. It's talking about your conscience. Your heart is your conscience. And your conscience is like a book or a square. And every time you go against your conscience, you cut off or shave off part of the edges, part of the corners. And you go against your conscience enough and you shave off enough of those corners on that square and you keep shaving off those corners eventually you don't have anything for your conscience to latch on to there is nothing else to shave off you've come full circle stop going according to your heart get some real direction and then follow that direction. When I say real direction, do not go according to the philosophy of man. There ain't no God. I know for a fact there ain't no God. Stop listening to that stupid stuff. Empty deception. You know, this is the way you need to go. I don't go that way. That way, that's the square. So go that way. No, go this way where everybody's doing everything right over here, where they're doing everything, whatever they want to do. Listen to your heart. Go on, go on over that way. Ladies and gentlemen, the Freemasons and the Illuminati. It is their job to keep throwing philosophy at you, which is why you have all these YouTube channels and all of these television shows that go contrary to nature, contrary to scripture, contrary to logic. That's their job. You think they just, the Illuminati just started? The Illuminati is an ancient organization. They didn't just start in Solomon's day. They existed before Solomon. But nobody pays attention. Harim Abif. If only you guys knew. They, look, the Masons let you know that they worship Tubal Cain. Do you know who Tubal Cain? This is the last thing. I ain't going to show you nothing else in scripture but this one. T-U-B-A-L-C-A-I-N. I think that's how you spell it. There he is, Tobal Cain. He's in the book of Genesis, see, 4, 17 to 22. The son of Lamech, by his second wife, Nazia. Therefore, a descendant of Cain, and a half-brother of Jabal, and Jubal. He had a sister named Nam. Tobal Cain was a forger of every sort of tool of copper and iron. Mason! I'm sorry. Which can be taken to mean that either he invented such tools or he founded or was prominent in the occupation. To Balkane, ladies and gentlemen, there's your introduction. This is who the Masons worship. To Balkane. Stop following that empty stupidity. That's all the Bible has to say about him. But yet they worship him. It doesn't say nothing else about him, but they worship. You didn't hear me incorrectly. They worship him. He's one of their idols. And we're not even going to talk about Cain. Remember, he's a descendant of Cain. We're not even going to talk about Cain. 
They don't know nothing about Cain other than what's written in the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter. That's it. There's nothing else written about Cain. They don't know nothing else. Well, they know because after the flood, the flood they're thinking that the book of Enoch. <laughs> oh, God. That Noah would carry such a book on the ark that a book of papyrus would survive the flood. You're right. Man, empty philosophy and thinking of ignorant men. Stop being misled, people. You're going into these courts. Go back over this video. Do your research and start challenging them on that stupid code that they claim is a law. And do what I do. They may not know what I'm talking about, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I demand you prove to me what your jurisdiction is. And don't tell me no stupid statute. You had better tell me a law. You guys have heard me say that over and over again. I do say that to courts. Look at my paperwork that I put in the courts. I agree with Thomas Clark Nelson that they have never directly responded to a single piece of paper I put on the record. And they never will. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to bring to you the difference between the law and the law. <laughs> Have a good night. I gotta go get some rest. Adios.